The crew of Apollo 13 is well known for having survived an explosion on their ship. What is not well known is that as they had to abandon their mission to land on the moon, their ship slipped past the far side and the farthest into space that our species has ever been. They were over 400,000 kilometers from home. As they came out of lunar orbit and fell back toward the Earth, gravity accelerated their ship to over 10,000 meters per second. To survive Earth's atmosphere, they had to enter at a very precise angle. When you become the captain of a starship, you will need to understand the principles of planetfall. In today's lesson, we will learn how that angle is calculated and much more. And we'll show how Starship will use the atmospheres of the Earth and Mars to safely land. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Any support you can offer on Patreon is appreciated. There is a link in the description. To understand how to safely land your starship, there are a few important concepts you must know. Orbital reentry and interplanetary reentry. Reentry angle and angle of attack. Peak heat flux and heat load. Peak deceleration and peak dynamic pressure. Let's look at these one at a time. Orbital reentry means your ship has been in a stable low Earth orbit. When a spaceship is in low Earth orbit, it has a minimum velocity of about 7.8 kilometers per second. Just a little slower, and it will fall out of orbit and enter the atmosphere. A spaceship will fire its engines to reduce its velocity so as to re-enter the atmosphere for landing. Spaceships launched from Earth have just enough fuel reserve to reduce their velocity this much, and cannot carry enough fuel to come to a dead stop, or even slow down very much. The reason for this goes back to the limits of chemical rocket engines. With the best chemical rockets, we can only hope to get about 5% of our starting mass into low Earth orbit. The amount of fuel that would be required to cancel out all of our horizontal velocity is easy to calculate using our delta V equation, and would be about the same that it took to get into orbit in the first place. This won't work, since we can't get that much mass into space with chemical engines. This is why a starship loaded with 1,200 tons of fuel will burn almost all of it getting to low Earth orbit and must refuel with multiple tanker flights to be able to go on to the Moon and Mars. Because they can't carry enough fuel to slow down before re-entry, spaceships with chemical rockets must find another way. Starship will have to use a planet's atmosphere to get rid of extra velocity so it can land. This is called EDL, or Entry, Descent, and Landing. When a ship fires a re-entry burn, and drops down below orbital velocity, it quickly loses altitude and starts to hit the top layers of the atmosphere. If the entry angle is steep enough, atmospheric drag will quickly start to slow the ship and it rapidly falls deeper into the atmosphere, where the air is denser and atmospheric compression causes heat to build up. This is orbital reentry. Orbital reentry applies only to ships that are in orbit around a planet. A ship coming back from interplanetary space, including the moon, can have much more speed and will be considered separately. A ship in orbit can turn its engines in the direction of travel and fire them, canceling out enough of its horizontal velocity to drop down out of orbit and enter the atmosphere, which remember is effectively at the Van Karman line, 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Good examples of this would be the Space Shuttle or Dragon capsule coming back from the ISS. These ships are fired into low Earth orbit by their booster systems. Once in orbit, they fire much smaller orbital maneuvering system rockets to match their launch orbits to that of their target orbits. To deploy a satellite or dock with the ISS or the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. Once the mission is accomplished, they fire their engines again, this time against the direction of travel, and slow down to fall out of orbit. They then position themselves to re-enter the atmosphere. They will make sure to cancel just enough velocity to bring them back into the atmosphere, in exactly the right place and at exactly the right angle. This allows the ships to safely slow down and either deploy parachutes or glide back to land. This is how re-entry from orbital velocity works, and all ships coming out of low Earth orbit to land should have a lateral velocity of about 7.8 km per second to 8 km per second on re-entry. Ships coming back from the Moon and Mars can go much faster, and they don't have a deorbit burn as such, though they will have to adjust their trajectory so as to hit the Earth's atmosphere at the right angle to survive re-entry. This is interplanetary re-entry. These ships can be going as fast as 11 kilometers per second. Like Apollo 10, a Mars return flight would be even higher, around 12 kilometers per second. 
At these speeds, the angle at which the ship strikes the atmosphere is critical. This is called the re-entry angle, and this is the next concept you must understand. The re-entry angle is limited by two parameters. If you come in too shallow, called an overshoot, the ship can continue back out into space, coming down into the atmosphere 90 minutes later, or it may fly at a high speed through the thin upper layers of atmosphere for too long, allowing heat load to soak past the shield and into the ship. If you come in too steep, called an undershoot, the ship will hit dense atmosphere at too high a speed, and the dynamic pressure will create enough g-forces to kill your crew, or enough dynamic force to tear your ship apart, or enough heat to burn it up. These seem backwards, but remember that an undershoot is too steep of an angle, and an overshoot is too shallow or small of an angle. The physical limits of your ship and crew determines the limits of your re-entry angle. The Apollo capsules coming back from the moon had to calculate their velocity before they came back into the atmosphere. With the velocity, they could calculate a minimum and maximum safe angle. The space between these angles is called a re-entry quarter. Being less than the minimum, and they could skip through and come back down at an uncontrolled angle or too far from their landing zone a full orbit later. Being more than the maximum, then they would be crushed by G-forces and burn up from overheating. Apollo 13 had to re-enter the atmosphere at between 5.3 degrees and 7.7 .7 degrees. Let's picture what this would mean. The re-entry angle applies to the direction of travel of the ship relative to the edge of the atmosphere of the Earth. The re-entry angle is determined by the flight trajectory and not the attitude of the ship. A re-entry angle of zero degrees would just touch the atmosphere for an instant and head off into space. An angle of 90 degrees would be coming straight into the atmosphere, where you would quickly be crushed by the G-forces and your ship would be torn apart then burn up. Let's start with these two extremes and get a mental concept of what a safe re-entry angle would be. If we cut the 90 degree angle in half, it would be 45 degrees, still way too steep. Cutting it in half again gives us 22.5 degrees, still too much. Half again gives us 11.25 degrees, and cutting it in half one more time gives us 6.125 degrees. This would be between the minimum and maximum for the Apollo 13 capsule, which came back at 10.5 kilometers per second, and is a good number to remember. The angle of attack describes the attitude of your ship's lifting surface with respect to the airflow. Here we see the space shuttle coming in. Its lifting surface is the bottom of the ship and the wings. As it glides through the air, the compressed air in front of the ship pushes back. This is called drag. Because of the angle of attack, some of this force pushes the ship up. This is called lift. Lift can keep the ship from losing altitude too quickly and allow it to dissipate heat over time. The Apollo Command capsule angle of attack was 27 degrees. That gave it enough lift to fall more slowly and safely through the atmosphere. The space shuttle came into the atmosphere with an angle of attack of about 40 degrees. It would also bank and turn, making several S maneuvers to dissipate heat and reduce velocity before coming in to land. The Starship will do the same. Starship will have a steep angle of attack when it comes in for maximum lift. It will use its aerodynamic surfaces to control its descent as it burns off heat and velocity. Being stainless steel with ceramic heat tiles, it will be able to tolerate heat loads that would destroy an aluminum or composite ship. To review these materials, you can watch these lessons. The Starship can also use a technique called aerobraking. Aerobraking is when you approach a planet at a shallow angle so as to fly your ship through just a small part of the atmosphere. This allows you to reduce your velocity. If you reduce it enough, you may be captured by the planet's gravity and go into orbit. Now you will come back around in your orbit and enter the atmosphere again if you don't burn fuel on the opposite side of the planet to circularize your orbit. Or you can just keep air braking until you stay in the atmosphere and come into land. The space shuttle had a lift to drag ratio of 0.5 to 1 at hypersonic velocity. This means it traveled half a kilometer horizontally for every one kilometer it lost in altitude. At supersonic velocity, that became 1 to 1, and at subsonic, it was 2 to 1, meaning it could glide 2 kilometers for every kilometer that it dropped in altitude. The Starship will probably be about the same. There are several people you will see plotting the survivability of Starship, coming in perpendicular to the atmosphere. Let me save you the math. The survivability is zero, but that is not what Starship will do. It will aerobrake as much as possible, then fly through the atmosphere using lift to reduce heat flux and velocity. Now let's look at heat flux and heat load. Every ship that re-enters the Earth's atmosphere from orbital or interplanetary velocities will experience extreme heating as the kinetic energy of the ship compresses the air in front of it. Compressed air heats up and temperatures can get high enough to tear the electrons off atoms, creating plasma. 
The suborbital flights of the New Shepard and Spaceship 2 experienced some heating, but these are not orbital spacecraft. Coming back from orbit with one of these would kill you very quickly. As the Starship enters the atmosphere, it creates a shock wave. This shock wave helps to shield the ship from a lot of the heat generated by atmospheric compression. This is why a blunt ship is better as it creates a broader shock wave. The SpaceX Falcon 9 booster creates a shield with its engines that deflects some of the heat as it re-enters. This helps it slow down and protects it from the worst of the heat stress. But a returning booster doesn't go above Mach 8 or 9, so it doesn't suffer the severe heat stress of coming in at Mach 25 that the Starship will. The heat that comes from the hot air in front of the shock wave is mainly transmitted to the ship by photons. A flow of energy is called flux, and the flow of thermal energy can be called heat flux. The heat flux will start low as the ship enters thin atmosphere and slows a little, then reach a peak as the density of the air increases while it is still at high velocity. Once it reaches the denser air, it will rapidly start to slow. At some point in re-entry, the heat flux will have reached a maximum, and this is called the peak heat flux. The heat will slowly be transmitted into and through your shield if given enough time. The heat load can become too high if your re-entry angle is too shallow and your flight time through the higher altitude is too long, allowing the heat to soak past the shield into the ship. This is called a high heat load. Think of touching something hot, then dropping it quickly. If there is not enough time for the heat to pass into your hand, there is a low heat load. If you hold a pan long enough, the heat will increase and burn you. It is important to plan your re-entry angle so that the heat load is not too high. The expected peak heat flux is one of the factors that will determine the properties of your heat shield. The next factor to consider is peak dynamic pressure. If the heat flux is too high, your shield will burn through. This is the second consideration to determine what type of heat shield you need. At the same time the ship is heating, it is experiencing dynamic pressure. We learned about dynamic pressure in this lesson. The dynamic pressure peaks where the velocity of the ship and the density of the air interact to reach a maximum. If the dynamic pressure is too high, pieces will start to tear off your shield in a process called spallation. Your shielding material must be non-conductive to heat so that heat transmission is blocked from the ship long enough for the heat to dissipate into the air. And it must be strong enough to survive the pounding of dynamic pressure and not break apart. A heat shield is a layer of material that prevents the heat of reentry from passing through into the ship. Heat shields are also called TPS or thermal protection systems. The Apollo Command capsules used a heat shield made of honeycombed fiberglass and phenolic resin called Avcoat, named for the company Avco that produced it. This was applied in layers, and as the capsule fell through the atmosphere, these layers would burn away, called sublimation, carrying heat away with them. And the materials would also undergo a process called pyrolysis where gases are produced from the burning shield. These gases block heat transmission. This is called an ablative heat shield. The problem with ablative heat shields is that you have to rebuild them if you want to reuse your capsule. They are also very heavy. The Orion capsule will use a modified Avcoat heat shield, just like Apollo. After Apollo, the military developed a lighter type of heat shield called PICA, which stands for Phenolic Impregnated Carbon Ablator, and used carbon fiber instead of the heavier fiberglass that Apollo used. This was approved for civilian use and used by NASA for unmanned probes coming back to Earth, like the Stardust probe, which came back to Earth at 12.4 kilometers per second, and the solid rocket booster nozzle linings. PICA would be a good choice for lunar return missions, as it has a low thermal conductivity. When SpaceX started designing the Dragon capsule, they looked at PICA for a heat shield, but they thought they could improve it. With a few dozen engineers and a few years, they had developed PICA X. PICA X is 10 times less expensive to use than the NASA version and easier to apply. It first flew in 2010. Since then, an even better version called PICA 3 was developed by SpaceX and has been used on the Dragon capsules since 2020. These systems are okay for spacecraft that will be rebuilt between missions, but starships need to be completely reusable. An active cooling system uses a substance to carry heat away from where it can do damage. The radiator in an internal combustion car is an active cooling system. SpaceX considered using small holes in the steel of a Starship to pump through excess fuel in a process called transpiration cooling. Now it looks like they plan to use heat tiles. Silica heat tiles were first developed for the Space Shuttle. These were mostly made from almost pure quartz sand. Quartz is made of silicon dioxide and does not transfer heat well. The Shuttle had over 24,000 of these tiles, almost all uniquely shaped. There are over five different types of tiles used for different areas of the ship. 
20,000 of the tiles were the black high temperature tiles glued along the bottom of the ship. They were glued to a flexible backing, which was then glued to the aluminum and steel of the ship. There were also white tiles used over the top of the ship to reflect sunlight. These tiles were supposed to last up to 100 missions, but quickly became a problem, having to be replaced or refurbished every mission, greatly limiting the ship's usefulness and dramatically increasing the operational expense. SpaceX plans to use thin ceramic heat tiles with a uniform shape on the bottom of the starships. The hexagonal shape prevents heat from traveling along any specific line between the tiles and causing a problem. The steel of the starship is also much stronger under heat load than the aluminum of the other spaceships and can safely absorb a much higher heat load. Robots will apply, inspect, and repair these tiles, dramatically reducing operational costs. Your starship is now ready to enter the atmosphere. Now we understand re-entry angle, angle of attack, peak heat flux, and heat load. And we've covered peak dynamic pressure. The last consideration is peak deceleration. This is where the angle of attack is also important. As your starship comes into the atmosphere, the broad surface of the underside, covered with heat tiles, will be pointed toward the airflow at a specific angle. This angle will be carefully calculated. As the starship begins to slow, the drag force will produce deceleration of the ship. The ship and everything in it will feel this deceleration just like a gravity force. We measure this deceleration by dividing it by 9.81 meters per second squared, the gravity on Earth, and call this unit 1G. The maximum recommended g-force allowed for human crews is about 4. Astronauts can survive up to 8 for a brief time, but this can break ribs and blood vessels. Any exposure at or above 9 g's for even a few seconds can be fatal. So when you become the captain of your own starship, plan your trajectory carefully. Make sure that you have calculated the correct arrow braking maneuver to slow down. Then plot your angle of entry and angle of attack to make sure your ship and crew can tolerate the landing. The atmosphere of Mars is not the same as Earth. The Van Karman line on Earth is at about 100 kilometers. The equivalent on Mars is at only 80 kilometers. On Venus, where I hope you never try to land your starship, but might need to aero break, the atmosphere effectively starts at 140 kilometers. This lesson shows how you can safely captain your starship to a smooth landing on the Earth or Mars. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Help us out on Patreon if you can at patreon.com slash Terran A link will be in the description. And stay safe at Astro Proterra.